Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains mad according to the world, but it's not me, it's the world that's mad. I'm the only sane one left, and soon my science shall reveal the truth. And today, we are going to discuss more mad science experiments, but instead of locomotives, we are going to turn our attention to the skies, as you probably could have guessed. Um, there have been plenty of times where aircraft, particularly airplanes, uh, have uh, been fiddled with and, uh, well, it turns out that some of them just wind up looking a little crazy. Like someone in the lab, in the design phase, was just like... <laughs> so we're going to talk about five planes that are clearly just mad science experiments because, I mean, the weird ones are usually the most interesting. The Douglas X-3 Stiletto. You know, that's one of those aircraft names that sounds weird when you hear it, but as soon as you see this plane, you're like, oh, no, 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 I get it. I totally get it. Developed in the 1950s, it first flew on the 15th of October, 1952. They only ever built one of them, and it was an experimental aircraft with a very, very slender fuselage and a very long, tapered nose. It looks pretty weird, but in its way, it's almost very modern. Its design did kind of set the stage for future jet aircraft, particularly ones in the fighter role. It was meant as a testbed to investigate design features for an aircraft that might be suitable for sustained supersonic speeds. It actually included the first use of titanium in major airframe components, specifically for this purpose. They already knew that going that fast would stress the airframe quite a bit. It needed to be strong. In the design phase, they planned for it to have a maximum speed of approximately 2,000 miles per hour. That's 3,200 kilometers per hour. But it never got anywhere close to that. It flew, don't get me wrong, but it was really underpowered. Its engine was not up to the task of achieving anywhere near that speed. Partially due to its dinky wings, it also was incredibly difficult to control. Its takeoff speed was rather high, 260 knots, that's 300 miles per hour or 480 kilometers an hour, much faster than a traditional aircraft. In normal level flight, it could not break Mach 1. It just wasn't going to happen. The only times it ever did was when the aircraft was already in a dive, therefore being aided a little bit by gravity. In a 15 degree dive, it reached Mach 1.1, and its fastest flight was made on the 28th of July, 1953. It reached Mach 1.208 in a 30 degree dive. They thought about re-engineing it with rocket motors to improve the speed issue, but they never actually did that, and I honestly don't blame them. The X-3 did wind up being useful in terms of other tests, not necessarily supersonic ones, but in terms of lateral and directional stability tests, it was actually very good. See, due to the mass of its engines, as well as the fuel and structure being concentrated in its long, narrow fuselage, while the wings were, again, very, very small, it was actually loaded, as they say, along its fuselage, rather than the wings. The test data would help future development for actual, genuine fighter aircraft, although those particular tests also revealed other flaws and almost ended in disaster. On the 27th of October, 1954, test pilot Joseph A. Walker made an abrupt left roll going at Mach 0.92, at an altitude of 30,000 feet, or 9,100 meters. The X-3 did roll as expected, but it also pitched up 20 degrees and yawed 16 degrees. This caused it to gyrate very badly for about 5 seconds before Walker was able to bring it back under control. He then poured it into another test dive, accelerating it up to Mach 1.154 at 32,356 feet, or 9,862 meters. And then he made it an abrupt left roll. The aircraft pitched down to record an acceleration of negative 6.7 Gs, then pitched upwards to positive 7 Gs. It also side-slipped during this, and that resulted in a loading of 2 Gs. Walker managed to bring it back under control again, but a post-flight examination showed that the fuselage had actually been subjected to its maximum load limit. Had the acceleration on the craft been any higher, like at all, it would have broken up. That being said, the data gathered from these test flights, whether they went well or not, did again 
supplied much-needed information for future aircraft development. So, as crazy as the stiletto wound up being, and as dangerous, it did actually pave the way for many future fighter aircraft. And the only one ever built is still around. In 1956, it was transferred to the National Museum of the United States Air Force at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. As of 2008, it's still on display there in the museum's Research and Development Gallery. The LeDuc 0.10 and 0.21. I see we rapidly accelerated into the mad science element of this. This appears to be an engine with wings! France? France? What are you doing over there? Well, the point 10, which is what I'm gonna call it because 0.10 is weird, was built specifically as a research aircraft. This is another one specifically designed for research purposes, so we're gonna forgive its odd design because it was built to collect test data, not to actually function as a plane. Though, it did fly. It's actually one of the world's first aircraft to fly powered solely by a ramjet. Ramjets are an interesting piece of technology, and a few aircraft have utilized them very effectively. They're technically jet engines, but they use the forward motion of the engine to produce thrust. As a result, they can't actually produce thrust when stationary. Another power source has to get them going forward first. In the .10's case, it was intended to be carried aloft by a parasite aircraft mothership. They used it for independent, unpowered gliding tests first to make sure it actually flew, which it did, and then the first power test took place on the 21st of April, 1949. The data was interesting, but the France authorities wanted to go bigger with the concept. That would eventually result in the Leduc 0.21. The .21 is basically the same thing, except it's been scaled up by about 30%. Once again, it's a ramjet, so it can't take off under its own power. It had to be carried aloft and released. It was again used for test purposes between 1953 and 1956. Both it and its smaller cousin were only ever meant for subsonic testing, so they never broke the sound barrier. But they did do their job. They supplied valuable data regarding ramjets and how they could be utilized in future aircraft. So, as crazy as they look, again, they really just look like an engine attached to wings, they did do what they were supposed to do. So, you can call them a success in that regard. The Antonov A-40 Krylia Tanka, or Tank Wings. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, um, I can't, it's hard to look at it, um, and take it seriously, but you have to admit, that is the most Soviet Russian thing you've ever seen in your life. As ridiculous as it looks, it did have some logical sense. It was in the middle of World War II, 1942, when this thing first flew, and yeah, it did fly. And the whole point was to try to get tanks into battlefields faster. Instead of having to go overland, you could attach these gliders, which is what they were, to the back of an actual plane and cast them off. The tanks could land in the field, detach the wings entirely, and roll out with their crews still on board. Normally, airdropping vehicles would require the crew to be dropped separately, and that could result in quite a bit of delay in terms of actually deploying the tanks properly. On paper, that's actually really good, because it should have been able to fly in, detach its wings, and actually be ready to fight within minutes. They used a T-60 light tank to test it. Only one was actually converted into a glider, and it was intended to be towed by a Petlyakov PE-8 or a Tupolev TB-3. To lighten the tank, they removed its armament, ammunition, and headlights. All of which actually defeats the purpose of it being ready for combat immediately. Like, I'm pretty sure it needs basically all of that to function in a battlefield. But okay, it's a test, whatever. And the thing is, even with those modifications, the TP3 bomber they used for the test actually had to ditch the glider during the only flight they ever did. September 2nd, 1942. The tank's drag was just too heavy for the bomber. Although, interestingly, the wings themselves, like the actual glider, totally worked. The tank actually did glide to the ground smoothly, but the problem was getting it into the air and keeping it there long enough to actually deploy it. The aircraft they had just weren't powerful enough to drag this stupid thing behind them, so the whole thing wound up being abandoned. The Lepich P-13A. That's an interesting looking aircraft. The P-13 
fuselage appears to also be the tail. Huh. Alright. Fair enough. Developed during World War II by German designer Alexander Lipich, this thing was actually meant to be a ramjet-powered delta-wing interceptor aircraft. There were a few different versions he was working with. There was the P-12, the P-13A, and the P-13B. We're gonna focus on the 13A just for this, but they all kinda had similar problems. And I admit that in many ways this is almost kind of a concept. They never really had a functional version of it. The war ended before they could get that far, but they did have the DM-1, which is a full-size glider that was meant to test the low-speed aerodynamics of the craft. Like I said, it was supposed to use ramjets, and he thought it might be able to achieve supersonic speeds, but it would carry no armament. Oh, see, no, no, no. This brilliant design was, and I feel like I've been talking about these a lot lately on my shorts, but I'm going to mention it again, this one was not supposed to have any guns. No, 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 no. It was going to ram its opponents. And why do we keep doing this in the 40s? What is the matter with everybody? Why would you ever design an airplane that is designed to smash into the enemy and survive? Like, that's not... No, 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 don't actually do that. In order to get the ramjet up to operational speed, because since the ramjet it has to have flowing air through it in order to do anything, they thought they could either use a catapult to launch them, or use booster rockets. Lipich had worked on the Messerschmitt ME-163, so he had some familiarity with rockets at that point. But he was not done with weird and questionable ideas. Oh no, 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 no. No, it wasn't enough to use a ramjet that requires the aircraft to have another way of moving forward before activating its primary thrust mechanism, or that it was specifically designed to smash into the enemy full tilt. Oh no. See, for whatever reason, Lepich really liked solid fuel, even when we're dealing with a ramjet, so much so that he believed that this aircraft should and could be powered by coal. I am not making this up. He thought it would be even more effective than liquid fuel, as the location of combustion was more precisely controllable. Now, there are so many issues I can bring up for why we don't use coal in airplanes. Like, at all. I think this might be the only time anyone's even attempted such a thing. Coal, for one thing, is heavy, and for two, solid-state fuels outside of rockets don't generally work well, especially in an air setting. And even in a rocket, a solid-state fuel can't be throttled. This would be utilized in a ramjet, and I'm not 100% convinced as to how that would even work. He actually did test it, and it technically worked, though the first initial test proved to be inefficient. Because yes, of course, it was inefficient. Why were you even doing this? Instead, he switched it up using a weird spinning circular basket that revolved on a vertical axis at 60 RPM. The hot exhaust would be mixed with cooler bypass air to improve thermodynamic efficiency. That was, of course, before being expelled through the rear nozzle. The initial test used brown coal. He also tried black coal. Then he tried pine wood, heat soaked in oil or paraffin. Ground tests show that it could work, but again, there's a reason we just don't do this. As far as the glide tests show, well, by that point, Lipich was kind of screwing around. He'd actually lost interest in the design, and apparently he only set up the glider project because he was convinced the war by that point was lost, which, in fairness, he was correct. Because of his decision, the students at the universities where they were testing the glider were kept from being drafted into the war as soldiers, potentially saving their lives. The glider wasn't even done by the time it was captured by American forces. But the U.S. did actually test it after the war, and they were positive. The design was actually pretty good. Elements from it would actually be later incorporated into NASA's research aircraft of the 1950s, and then on. So in that regard, it did actually do some good in the end. Just not with the coal thing. We don't use coal to power our aircraft. We're never going to do that. No one is going to do that. Why would you ever do that? The Convair X-6 and the Tupolev Tu-95LAL. This is a double entry, because both these aircraft did kind of the same thing, and both were very ill-advised. Although, admittedly, neither of these projects actually got to the point of being super de duper dangerous. See, the whole point of these respective projects was to do one thing, to develop an aircraft that was... NUCLEAR POWERED! Yes, 
in the realm of mad science, how could we not have a nuclear-powered aircraft? And two of them! Yes, there were supposed to be anyway. The X-6 was meant to be a modified B-36 bomber, and the TU-95 LAL was, well, a modified TU-95. Both projects, of course, were carried out respectively by the United States and the Soviet Union, separately, but about the same time period, late 50s, early 60s. But they never got to the point of actually genuinely being powered by the nuclear reactors they had on board these planes. Why? Well, do I have to explain why? There is some inherent benefit to using nuclear power in this regard. A plane powered like this would be similar to a nuclear submarine. Nuclear subs can stay under the water, out at sea, for months. A plane powered this way could do something similar. It could fly for a really long time before having to land. The issues, of course, are in the realm of safety here. At least with a sub, it'll sink, and they're designed to isolate their reactors if that happens, so there's generally no danger to the outside environment as long as the reactor stays contained. But with a plane, I mean, if something goes wrong and it crashes, it could wind up anywhere. Both the United States and the Soviets were well aware of this, though they did actually do airborne tests with the reactor. In the NB-36H's case, as it was known at that point, the reactor did not power the plane at the point it was being tested. It was specifically to test how it would behave, as well as the effect of radiation on aircraft systems. Based on the results, it wound up being abandoned by 1961 because, uh, no, no, we're not doing that, because that's horrifying. The Soviets wound up with a similar conclusion. Their TQ-95 LAL completed over 40 research flights from 1961 to 1969, the vast majority of which actually had the reactor shut down. A big portion of their flights was to test the effectiveness of the radiation shielding they were using. They also wound up canceling the whole project because, well, same reasons. They were also well aware of the inherent risk involved with doing something like this. And additionally, ICBMs were coming into the fold. A bomber that could stay in the air for weeks or months at a time wasn't actually needed if you had a missile that could hit a target on the other side of the planet in a few hours. Why have the inherent risk of a possible nuclear catastrophe happening literally anywhere on the planet unplanned when you can, well, cause a nuclear catastrophe by starting a nuclear war with a missile, but at least there you can plan it. You know exactly where it's gonna end up. It's all a matter of control here, people. This setup was not really in control of anybody. If anything went wrong, it would be something that couldn't be predicted. At least with the missiles, they knew exactly what was going to happen, which is probably why they never launched any of those, because it would have been a catastrophic thing. But the point is, both sides knew the risks, but they were testing it. They were really thinking about it. How is that not a mad science experiment, I ask you? These planes look normal, but hiding beneath them is a nuclear cataclysm waiting to happen. It's a good thing both governments were actually pretty reasonable about this and decided not to go through with it. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Lord Captain Von Frost III, Sundu267, Orange Glass, Joshua Long, Ohio Trucker 1, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hoth 444, Arthur Roy, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsum 131-232, Mr. Black Rose, Travel Typhoon, Master of None, Josh Johnson, Lock Kraken, Twin Fox, Dime Blade 17, Anzac A1, and... Dozzy Was It. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.